Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to worship your holy name today. We thank you for the opportunity to sing praises to you. And now to look into your word. And Father, as we look into your word, just remind us again that you are the only one who is necessary. Father, if we were all to disappear immediately, if all creation were to dissolve, you would still exist. You are the only necessary being there is. Father, that puts us in perspective. It's all about you. It's not about us. It never has been about us. It never will be about us. It is all about your glory. And Father, it's only when we come to terms with that, only when we come to realize that and recognize that truth that we will have joy in you for when you are glorified, we are able to see and savor and enjoy your glory. And Father, one day you'll bring us home to be with Jesus and he will spend eternity showing us his glory. And we will revel in who he is, who you are, who the Spirit of God is. Father, help us to be mindful of our place before you. You are the creator. We are the creature. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth and to give attention to your word. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. You've probably never heard, maybe you have, of Buford Husser, the Tennessee sheriff who took care of crooks and drug runners, corrupt politicians, and problems in his county by swinging a big stick. Buford was six foot six. He was a 250-pound former pro wrestler known as Buford the Bull, who became sheriff of rural McNary County, Tennessee in 1964. And over the course of six years, until he was killed in a car crash, he single-handedly, pretty much, cleaned up his county simply by showing up with his hickory stick and breaking skulls. <laughs> the undesirables and the crooks' hatred for Buford was surpassed only by their fear of him. As for the good folks of McNary County, they loved him and his all-powerful stick from a distance. <laughs> Glad he took law and order and bad guys seriously, but at the same time hoping Buford, who was the inspiration for the Walking Tall movies, would never show up on their front porch to say hello. They didn't want that. Well, that's sometimes how we as believers feel about God. We have this desire to grow close to God, to enjoy fellowship with Him, but tend to love him from a distance because we're basically afraid of him and his proverbial stick. You see, even we believers can find that our love for God is oftentimes surpassed by our fear of God. And that's because we really don't know him as he really is, and as he has made himself known to us in his word. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today as, as we begin unpacking Genesis 17, where Abraham, who has been living outside the will of God and thus in an unrepentant state for some 13 years, gets a personal visit from God. Now, it'll be helpful to us to understand as we look at Genesis chapter 17, that this was written for us to learn some things about God and about ourselves. This was also written for the Hebrews that Moses was leading through the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula on their way to the Promised Land. So Moses is recording all of these stories so that God's people can have a better understanding of who God is and how God relates to us, His people. So it would help us to understand what the people of Israel were like and, and really to understand that we're a whole lot like them. They were the spiritually struggling, weak in faith, and often unrepentant Hebrews or Israelites whom again Moses had led out of Egypt. He was taking them to the promised land. 
And they, because they didn't know God very well, struggled to trust Him. They struggled to believe Him. They struggled to rely upon Him. And so they tended to follow God from a distance. And to make things worse, because they were following God from a distance, they tended to struggle as well with a great many sin issues which they tried to hide and they tried to suppress just like we do instead of dealing with and repenting of these sin issues. And this only increased their sense that God was angry with them. And this caused them to doubt that God's intention and that God's inclination toward them was good all the time. And so again, that's one of the reasons why God has Moses record Genesis so as to introduce God to us, his people, who need to get to know him much better than we do. And so this is also why when we come to Genesis 17, God makes it a point to introduce himself by a new name, the name El Shaddai. Now Amy Grant made that name popular several years ago, probably about 50 years ago, 100 I don't know how long ago it's been since Amy Grant was singing. Not that long when she came out with that song, El Shaddai. Well, that's the name that we're going to be looking at in Genesis chapter 17 this morning. And as we do, I trust that we will see that God always keeps His promises and always is faithful and always does us who are His people good no matter what. So let's read. We're going to read just the first, oh, I think... A uh, few verses of Genesis 17, and then we'll start to unpack that. So Genesis 17, verse 1. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, so there's a 13-year gap between the end of Genesis 16 and Genesis 17. So this is 13 years later. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. So God is coming to Abraham 13 years after he has sinned. So there's been this, this gap of 13 years in which God and Abraham have not been talking to one another. Abraham is involved in unrepentant sin because he's not dealing with the sin of having sex with his wife's maid and then bringing Ishmael into the world as a means of trying to fulfill God's promise, man's way. So God comes down for a little talk. But what the Bible wants us to see is that when God comes down for this talk, his intention is not to do harm. Not to do evil, not to do anything bad to Abraham, but to do him good. That's why the psalmist says in Psalm 27, 13, that he would have despaired unless he had believed that he would see only the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So God wants us to understand that as believers, that's all we will receive from him is good. Even if we are in a state of sin and unrepentance for 13 years like Abraham was. Now this does not mean that God does not chastise us or God does not spank us or God does not bring us to repentance through hard situations and difficult circumstances. But those things are ultimately for our good. God always will do what is good for His people. So if you're a believer, if you're trusting in Jesus alone as your only Lord and Savior, then you are seeing right now and you are experiencing only the goodness of the Lord in your life because you stand in grace. That's what Romans 5 says. That we stand in grace. Ever since you came to Christ, 
You have been the recipient of God's grace. In fact, in your salvation, you've been the recipient of God's grace. And you are in grace right now so that everything you experience in this life, everything, comes from God's grace and God's intention to do you and I good. So God has this intention that we talked about last week at least four things that he's doing in all of our lives through everything that we experience, whether we think it's good or not. And these four things, by way of review from last week, is that God is always drawing us into a closer relationship with himself. And keep in mind, that may cause hard things. That may cause pain to do that. I can remember when my children were, were young and as they were starting to enjoy a little bit of independence, when they began to learn how to walk, and then they began to learn how to run, and they would want to run wherever they wanted to go. And sometimes you had to yell, no, stop, you need to come back here. Mm -hmm. and, and when they wouldn't want to stop and come back here, my way of showing them good was to go after them and give them a spanking on the seat of their pants. Because I wanted them to learn how to obey. Now I know we don't do that today, that that's not politically correct. And we've seen what happens as a result of that, don't we? Yeah, yeah so we're, we're in real good shape today. Um, but I caused pain in order to bring about good. And so God will draw us into a closer relationship with himself, sometimes by bringing pain into our lives. Because the goodness of the Lord is that we walk with him, next to him. You know, sometimes a shepherd will break the leg of a sheep that keeps wandering off. And after he breaks the leg of that sheep, he'll have to carry that sheep until that sheep's able to walk again. Well, that sheep has learned to stay close to the shepherd. But God uses pain sometimes to do that. So God is always drawing us into a closer relationship with himself. He's always making us like Jesus, conforming us to the image of Christ. That's the second thing that God is doing that is good in our life in every situation you are in and that I'm in. The third thing is that God is always going to use our life as a demonstration and manifestation and aroma, if you will, as Paul said, we saw this last week, of the gospel. He's always going to use you as an influence for good in other people's lives because of the gospel being at work in your life, wherever you go, wherever you're at. And finally, the fourth thing that God's going to do in our lives, which is for our good, is he's going to bring us safely home one day to be with him in glory forever. So those are the things that God is doing in all of our lives for our good. But he does a whole lot of other things for our good too. But those are the four things he's doing in all of our lives all the time. Now, as we saw last week, Abraham and Sarah had gotten tired of waiting on God to fulfill his promise of giving them a son. So they came up with this plan for Abraham to have his son through another woman because Sarah could not have children. And so Sarah gave her maid Hagar to Abraham as a concubine, if you will, so that he could have this son through her. So he's trying to do God's work in the flesh. He's trying to do God's work man's way. And that never, ever works. And again, that's how Genesis 16 ends with Ishmael being born. And the result, as the result of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar's sin. And apparently, God doesn't say anything about this for 13 years until we get to Genesis chapter 17. Nothing, not even boo. And, and that helps us understand something. It helps us understand that just because God doesn't interrupt our lives immediately after we sin it doesn't mean he won't bring it up sometime down the road when we least expect it. If we have not dealt with it in repentance. You see, God understands that sometimes the best time is not immediately after you have sinned. Even David did not receive the prophet Nathan until several months later after his sin with Bathsheba and killing Uriah. Sometimes God delays purposely in bringing to our mind the fact that we have sinned against Him. And then we're caught by surprise, aren't we? 
Because immediately after we sin, we have all these defensive mechanisms in place of how we're going to deal with this whenever somebody confronts us about our sin, don't we? Usually we come up with a story, a lie, some kind of scheme that's going to make us look good and it's going to get us out of this thing. And so God just lets us do that. And then on that day when we never expected, boom, God shows up for a visit. And he says, I'd like to talk to you about something. And we weren't expecting it. Our defenses are down. And like Abraham, you kind of just stand there with your mouth open. Well, it's kind of what's happening here in Genesis 17. And again, it's always important for us to understand that God always deals with our sin. And always it's going to work to bring us to repentance because that's for our good. Even if it takes years, he's going to do that. And so here in Genesis 17, after 13 years of silence, God appears to Abraham and he's going to deal with this sin and he's going to reaffirm the promises that he is still going to give Abraham a son, even though Abraham has failed. He's still going to make him the father of a multitude of nations, even though he has sinned. He's still going to give him and Sarah new names, even though they don't act like they should have new names. And he's going to establish a covenant with Abraham and his physical descendants using circumcision as the physical sign of that covenant. But first, Abraham needs to be drawn back into fellowship with God and invited to live life with him again. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine going 13 years without living life with God. Can you? I can't imagine going 13 years without having a conversation with God or without really thinking a whole lot about God. Sin can blind us to a lot of things, and it can blind us sometimes to the necessity of God. You know, we can fill our lives with so many kinds of activities, so many kinds of things, some good, some bad, but if we have lost the sense of God in our lives, that is a dangerous place to be. A dangerous place to be. So God is going to draw Abraham back into fellowship with him. And he's going to invite him to live life with him again. And as he always does, God himself takes the initiative. He takes the initiative. We don't see Abraham taking the initiative. God takes the initiative, just like he does in all of our lives. So God takes the initiative to restore Abraham back to himself after Abraham had decided he had a better plan for his life than God did. And so that brings us to Genesis 17, 1. Let's just look at that because there's a lot in there that we need to see. Now, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram. It seems pretty basic, but, but there's a lot in there. The Hebrew word that the Bible uses for appeared is ra. It basically means to self-appear or to be made visible. So, so the Lord doesn't come to Abraham as he has in the past in a vision, in a dream, or merely in a voice from heaven, but rather he self-appears. That's what the word means, self-appear. He makes himself visible. And so God comes to Abraham and he makes himself visible visible to Abraham. Now, now we need to recognize that that means that this has to be which member of the Godhead? This has to be God the Son. Because God the Son is the mediator between God and man. God the Father cannot be approached. He dwells in inapproachable light. No man can see Him. No man can approach Him. But the second member of the Godhead, God the Son, whom we know better as Jesus, is the member of the Godhead that takes upon himself bodily form in the Old Testament when he appears to God's people. In the New Testament, he actually became a man. He became the God-man when he was incarnated into human flesh so that he could go to the cross and pay our sin penalty. But when you see God appearing, self-appearing, becoming visible to people, we're seeing the second member of the Trinity, the mediator, the one who goes between God and man. So the Lord doesn't come to Abraham as he had in the past. He, he actually makes himself visible to Abraham. And, and, and we see this supported later in Genesis 17, verse 22, 
where the Bible tells us that after God was done talking to him, Abraham sees God go up into the sky as he ascends from Abraham. Look over at verse 22. At the end of the conversation in chapter 17, when he, God, finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. That, that's the Hebrew word for ascend. He ascends up, just like he does in Acts when he ascends from the earth and goes back to heaven. Now, Jesus gives us insight into this in John 8, verse 56, when he tells the unbelieving Jews that your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. In other words, Jesus makes the claim in John 8, verse 56, that there was a time in Abraham's life when he saw Jesus. He saw God the Son and was glad. And one of those times would have been here in Genesis 17, 1, when God the Son, whom we know as Jesus, shows up to have a talk with Abraham. And he shows up as God Almighty. He says, Abraham was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to Abraham and he said to him, I am God Almighty. Now, God Almighty comes from the Hebrew words El Shaddai. El Shaddai. That's what El Shaddai means. God Almighty. So God the Son appears as El Shaddai to have this talk with Abraham who's been living in this unrepentant state of sin for 13 years. That's not dealt with the sin. El Shaddai is a compound name. In other words, it has two parts. The first part is the name El. E-L. The second part of the name is Shaddai. And we've seen El before. It's the shortened form of Elohim. It usually means power. In fact, really, that's what it does mean. It's talking about raw, unlimited, unstoppable, uncontainable, immeasurable power. In the sense that God can do whatever He desires to do. And no one, absolutely no one or no thing, can stop Him. Him. Now, we've seen, again, this name for God before. Back in Genesis 1, when it was used of the member of the Godhead, the member of the Trinity who brought creation into existence, which Colossians tells us was God the Son, Jesus. So, if God had just introduced Himself here as El, without Shaddai, we, we would see God introducing Himself as God the Creator. The possessor of unlimited, unrestrainable, unstoppable, all capable and immeasurable power. Incomprehensible power. In, in other words, God with a big stick. God with a big stick. Willing and able to do whatever He desired and able to enforce His will anywhere, anytime, with anyone. And, and this would have probably made Abraham a little nervous. But you see, God doesn't just introduce himself as El. He, he doesn't just introduce himself as the all-powerful creator. He adds this other word, Shaddai, to the name. And, and so what does Shaddai mean? That, that we need to understand that part of this new name that Abraham is being introduced to, that we're being introduced. Well, it pretty much means the same thing. Um, it, it means the all-powerful one. And because he's the all-powerful one, he's the necessary one. But, but the interesting thing about Shaddai is that even though it means pretty much the same thing, the all-powerful one, it's not so much describing God's unlimited, unstoppable, unrestrainable, and immeasurable power as much as it is emphasizing that when God's power is unleashed into our lives, it's always used for His ultimate glory and our ultimate good. In other words, God never uses His awesome power to do His reputation or His glory harm, and He never uses His awesome power to do His people harm. Never. So He uses Shaddai, and He tags that on there so that Abraham will have this understanding. I'm here to deal with you. We're going to talk about some things. And I have the power to destroy you. 
I have the power to condemn you. I have the power to sentence you for all of eternity to hell. But because you're mine, I won't. Rather, I will use my power for your good. And, and what made Abraham God's was the fact that in Genesis 15, he believed in God. He believed in God, just like you and I do when we come to God for salvation. And so God would say the same thing to us. I will deal with your sin. I will deal with your rebellion. I will give you the spanking of all spankings if you need it. But I will never use my power to condemn you. I will never use my power to eternally harm you or damage you only for your good and for my glory. Now, now the word Shaddai is used 48 times in the Old Testament. And when it's used, it's used in relation to God manifesting His power in the lives of and on behalf of His people, those people who have believed in Him, who have a relationship with Him. And, and, and while it's sometimes used in the context of discipline for wrongdoing so as to bring about repentance, which is ultimately for our good. Most of the time, it's used in the context of God being more powerful than us and our ability to make an eternal train wreck of our lives. It's used of God being far more powerful than Satan is to ruin and to destroy us. It's used of God being more powerful than our sin is to condemn us. It's used of God being more powerful than our ability to reverse His love, His compassion, and His mercy toward us. In other words, it's His power to keep us in His hand and never let us go. So this is the kind of power that God is introducing to Abraham here. And in this sense, the name El Shaddai is picturing God using His unlimited, unstoppable, uncontainable, immeasurable, inexhaustible, incomprehensible power for our good to bring about His good will and good plan for our lives, regardless of all we may have done to ruin it. God's simply saying, you don't have that kind of power, I'm sorry. And aren't we glad? Amen. Amen. But more than that, there's more to Shaddai. Shaddai also has the idea of God's unlimited power being used tenderly. It's, it's, it's the tender use, the gentle use of God's power to nurture and to nourish and to protect and to guard and to comfort, to encourage and care for and meet all the needs of his people. It's interesting when you look over at Genesis 18 and verse 14, we get a picture of this power after God has promised Abraham and Sarah that they're going to have a child, and yet God just delays to bring about that promise. And He delays to bring about that promise until it's impossible for them to have a child. I mean, now, that's the whole point of why God doesn't give Abraham and Sarah a child when they're in childbearing years. He waits until it would be utterly impossible to have a child. And then God says, okay, now we're going to do it. And why does God do it? Because He wants to demonstrate the power of this name El Shaddai. And in verse 14, He says, is anything, of chapter 18, so Genesis 18, 14, is anything too difficult for the Lord? And the answer is no. So he introduces his name, and then he's going to give them the example. He said, listen, this is what you're going to do. You're going to have this child, this son. I've been telling you about this, and, and you're just going to be past the age of childbearing. It's going to be impossible. There's no way this could happen physically, biologically, no way at all. But I'm El Shaddai. I can do whatever I want. Do you believe that God can do the impossible? Now, for some of you... There, there's things you're going through in your life and you've got a lot of impossibilities facing you. you. You've got situations and you've got circumstances and you have no idea how they are going to work out. Some of you are concerned about the church. You're concerned, oh boy, we're going to be looking for a new pastor. And I've got to tell you, I, I feel really bad about that except for the fact that I know that God's leading us where He's leading us. And that gives me the confidence to know that God's leading you too. 
And as impossible as it may seem to some people that, oh, what's going to happen? Is, is good going to come out of this? Is God going to bring us a, a good, solid Bible teaching pastor and all those kinds of things? And, and, and some of you may be saying, man, I just don't know if it's possible. I, I think we're just going to close up and, and die. <laughs> well, you need, to, you need to get to know El Shaddai. Amen. You need to get to know this El Shaddai. And he says, is anything too hard for the Lord? No, of course not. Interesting enough, in the book of Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 13, a form of, of this name, Shaddai, is used in a most interesting way. L listen to me read it. See if you can figure out which word is translated from the name Shaddai. Here's the verse. And keep in mind, Song of Solomon is a love story, right? So, so God likes love stories. My beloved is to me a pouch of myrrh which lies between my breasts. Which word is Shaddai? Beloved. What's that? Beloved. Beloved? No. <laughs> it's the word breasts. That's Shaddai. You say, what? That's weird. We see the Old Testament uses this form of the word Shaddai about 24 times in referring to the breasts of a woman which provides nourishment, comfort, tenderness, protection, life, and love to a vulnerable, defenseless infant. Do you see why God uses that, that word? You see, His power is, is not just this great power that we imagine like some dynamite exploding or some bomb going off or, or the power to just do things that we could never imagine. It's also the power to calm you. To relax you. To nourish you, to comfort you, to protect you, to, to give you that life nourishment from his word that you need and to really love you. And so when you put the picture all together, what we see is that God comes to Abraham 13 years after his sin, which Abraham has not repented of, and he introduces himself again to Abraham as the Almighty all-powerful, unstoppable, all-loving, all-nurturing, all-comforting, all-tender and life-sustaining God whose desire and intent is to do Abraham who is a believer. Don't miss that. This is for believers. Whose desire and intent is to do Abraham who is a believer good, not harm, even though he continues to sin against God. So, so in Genesis 17, we're not seeing Abraham in the best possible place he could be. We're seeing God dealing with him as a guy who still hasn't repented of his sin and hasn't for 13 years. And even when you get into Genesis 17, we won't get there today, even after God has given him his promise and says, I'm going to bring my promise to the son I'm going to give to you, Abraham, in verse 18 of Jim, chapter 17, said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. He still wants Ishmael to be the seed. Still wants Ishmael to be the promise. And God knows that. And God still is being tender and loving and kind and doing good to Abraham. Wow, what a powerful testimony of the eternal security of the believer. This is a testimony to God's eternal security. In that God will never use His power to harm you if you are His, but will always use it for your good even when you haven't been so good. Wow. Now, now let's look at what else God says to Abraham in the second half of, of verse 1. Man, we, we're just in the first half of the first verse. He says, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. And then look what He says. Walk before me and be blameless. Walk before me and be blameless. In other words, now that you know I'm not mad at you 
for your sin. Because as Romans 8.1 says, there's therefore no condemnation or wrath for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the reason why there's no anger and wrath and condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus for their sin is because God the Father unleashed His fury upon Jesus who took our place on the cross. He poured out His justice and His righteous anger for our sin upon Jesus so that if you're in Christ Jesus, there is no more left for you. Jesus drained the cup. And again, we look at that story in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus asked God three times, is it possible to do this another way? In His humanity, He is asking His Father, is it possible to save them another way? And he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he was asking God the Father, can this cup pass from me? Is there another way? And the Father says, no, there is no other way. Someone has to pay the price. Someone has to drain the cup. And Jesus is the one who drained the cup so that we could go free. So that's why God can say to Abraham what he's saying here. And basically he's saying, I'm not mad at you. So when you sin, God's not mad at you. You, you get this, I know God's mad at me. No, read Romans 8, 1 a hundred times until you get it locked in your brain. There is therefore now no condemnation. There's no wrath. There's no anger for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus has paid it all. And you either you believe that or you don't. And that allows you to get on your knees and start talking to God again. Because your sin's been removed. See, that's part of the problem for 13 years with Abraham. Sin left unresolved causes us not to come and deal with God. And we're hiding because we think He's, what, mad at us. God said, I'm not mad at you. Live like the saved and forgiven and accepted child of God that you are. That's what he's saying here. When he says, walk before me and be blameless, he's saying, listen, live like the forgiven person that you are. Live like the accepted child of God that you are. That's what God's telling Abraham to do. Live forgiven and live accepted by me. And that means you're going to walk with me, which is to say, you're going to fellowship with me. We're going to talk. Freely, without you feeling like you're going to hide something or qualify something. When God tells Abraham to be blameless, he's not telling Abraham to go out and live a perfect, sinless life. I mean, Abraham's already demonstrated that's impossible. And if Abraham hadn't demonstrated that, you and I certainly have, haven't we? But that's not really what that word is talking about. In Hebrew, blameless comes from the Hebrew word tamim, which means whole, complete, innocent, without blame, and really it means unable to be blamed. So, so what God is telling Abraham to do is live as a person who has been forgiven of great sin and who can never be condemned or punished or blamed for that sin again. Because Jesus, who is the member of the Trinity who appeared to Abraham as El Shaddai, paid for Abraham's sin on the cross too so that he could be blameless before God. Listen, when you stand before God, on the day that you stand before God, Jesus is going to present you blameless. Did you know that? Yeah. I, I, I mean, and, and we know experientially that we're not blameless, but in God's sight, you are blameless because Jesus paid for your sin. And when he went to the cross paying for your sin, he took the blame for your sin. He was judicially found guilty by God the Father of our sin. That's how far God went with it. So that God could be just in punishing Jesus as the one who took our sin and became guilty of it. So that we could go free. Wow. Mm And so the reason why Jesus can present us before the Father as blameless is because we really are. He's not making it up. You will be presented blameless 
And, 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 and God's going to look at you and He's going to receive you as a blameless person because Jesus took the blame for your sin. Publicly. Those sins that we are ashamed to even mention. Wow, and that, that, that's so powerful. So again, what, what God's telling Abraham to do is hey, live as a forgiven person. Live as a justified person who, who can never be condemned or punished for your sin because Jesus yeah. paid for it. And, and then, then notice in Genesis 72, 17, 2, that God says this, I will establish my covenant between me and you. I will multiply you exceedingly. He, he's, he's saying, listen, I'm going to bring about the promise that I gave you back in Genesis 12, back in Genesis 15. I, 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 your sin has not destroyed my promise. And, and, and folks, you've got to understand that. God, your sin will never destroy God's promise. God's promise is greater than your sin. God's promise is greater than my sin. We cannot destroy God's promise by our sin. That is good news. So in Genesis 72, what God is saying that I'm going to establish my covenant between you and me. I am going to fulfill my promise. I am going to multiply you exceedingly. And in essence, what God is saying to Abraham is this. I and I alone will bring about my will and my plan for you and your life. And I don't need your help. Stay out of it this time. That's what he's saying. And look at Abraham's response in verse 3. Abraham fell on his face. And God talked with him, saying, in other words, now we're going to talk together. Wow. Abraham falls on his face and he worships. And God begins talking to him. And he talking to God. And the conversation has resumed. The promise has, has been reiterated. And everything's good. And in verse 4, it's, it's interesting. We're going to start closing now. Starting to bring the plane down for a landing. When he says... And you will be the father of a multitude of nations. That word nations is referring not to governments. Not, not to nations like Brazil or Argentina or China or the United States. It's talking about people groups. Ethnos. It's talking about different, distinct, ethnic groups with a common language and a common culture. So we know that Abraham was the father of the Hebrew people, which is just one people group. So what God is talking about here, when he tells Abraham that he's going to be the father of a multitude of different and distinct people groups, he's referring to the fact that while Abraham is the physical father of the Hebrew or the Jewish people, which was indicated through circumcision, which he's going to talk about here in just a little bit. We're not going to get into that today. But according to Romans 4, 16 through 25, Abraham is also the spiritual father of all people everywhere, from every people group on the earth, who, realizing they are sinners and in danger of being condemned to eternal punishment, place saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, just like Abraham did. So, Abraham is, is the father of all believers who, like him, place their faith in Jesus. So he has a physical descendants. He's got physical descendants, which is the nation of Israel, but he has spiritual descendants, which are all believers. And so God is making him the promise, you are going to be the father of a multitude of people groups. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. Abraham, or Abram meant exalted father, Probably when people came to visit Abram and they'd hear his name, Exalted Father, they'd ask, how many kids do you have? And up until he finally has Isaac, he had to say, none. <laughs> Abraham means the father of many nations. So God gives him a new name, reinstates his promise, gives him a new name, promises him he hasn't lost his destiny. He's forgiven and there's no reason why he and God can't start talking again. So let me ask you, are you a spiritual descendant of Abraham? Have you come to God the Father through Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, for salvation? Are you trusting in Jesus and in His finished work of paying for your sins on the cross of Calvary and then rising from the dead the third day to prove that they were actually paid for? And the payment was accepted by God the Father. That's what the resurrection is all about. 
Are you one who has been invited to walk in fellowship with God Almighty? And will you see Jesus smiling at you face to face the moment you die and leave this world? Will he be the first face that you see? And will he be smiling? Yes. If you, like Abraham, have believed in Jesus Christ, otherwise known as El Shaddai. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for Genesis. Wow, Lord. I think that probably many struggled when, when they heard that we were going to go through Genesis. Probably some that were thinking, oh man, where are we going to get out of Genesis? Mm -hmm. Lord, I hope you've proved them all wrong. Mm -hmm. And shown us that just like Jesus said in Luke 24, Genesis and the rest of the whole Bible is all about me. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the gospel. It's all about your relationship with us and how you only use your power or good in the lives of those who have believed in your Son and love Jesus. Wow. Thank you for that. It gives us the confidence to know that whatever we're going through is a manifestation of your good, even if it hurts. We are receiving good from you, not evil. So, Father, continue to do in our lives that which will draw us into a closer relationship with Jesus. Conform us more to his image. To use us as a sweet aroma of the gospel at work in our lives. And then get us home safely to heaven one day. And we will be thankful. In Jesus' name, amen.